Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to an online event uh, of Tokyo College today. My name is Haneda Masashi. I will assume the moderator of today's uh, very interesting event. Uh, today, we have a special guest from Princeton University, uh, Professor Jim Raimo, uh, a professor of sociology and East Asian studies. Uh, he is a sociologue, but uh, at the same time, he is an expert of East Asian studies Japan studies in particular. Uh, he is vice president of the Population Association of America and associate editor of Demography uh, and Journal of Gerontology Social Sciences. So he is a very important uh, figure in the field of uh, demography and sociology. Uh, some of you may know uh, him because last year uh, he appeared as a moderator of a series of online uh, dialogues between researchers of uh, Princeton University and those of the University of Tokyo. Uh, video to, videos of these uh, dialogues are uploaded later uh, to our YouTube channel. So some of you uh, may uh, remember his face. Mm -hmm. And he uh, uh, is, uh, uh, he has been in uh, Tokyo College uh, since last June, uh, and uh, will work with us until uh, next December. So uh, we are enjoying very much uh, talking with him, discussing various issues with him uh, in various academic fields. Uh, he's the leader of Global Japan Lab, a uh, newly established research institute at Princeton University and responsible for, for Princeton U Tokyo strategic partnership, as he is without doubt a very uh, important key figure in Princeton to connect U Tokyo to Princeton. Uh, today, he will give a lecture with the title Family and Inequality, Diverging Destinies in Japan. In Japan, okay. uh, all of us are conscious of <laughs> inequality and disp disparity. His lecture will certainly show us a very interesting landscape of the current Japanese society. Since this is a uh, in form format of webinar, uh, you can uh, post mm -hmm. your comments or uh, questions freely at any moment by using a, a button of, I don't know quite well, chat, chat button maybe? Yeah, no, yeah. Q and a Q and a button. So, uh, Without waiting, uh, let's start uh, the lecture. Uh, let's listen to uh, Professor Jim Lemo, please. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, before I, <clears throat> excuse me, get started, there are several things that I would like to um, say uh, to follow up that uh, introduction. The first, of course, is to give my thanks to Professor Haneda and Professor Mino and others here at Tokyo College um, a, um, for the opportunity to share with you some of my own research that I hope is interesting um, to those of you listening, uh, but more importantly, for the invitation to spend uh, a little over half a year here at Tokyo College. Um, like all sabbaticals, this one has gone by very fast, but at the same time, I feel that it has been an incredibly productive um, period of time not not only, of course, for the ability to do my own research, but more importantly, to engage in some of the collaborative activities that Professor Haneda was just um, mentioning. Uh, the University of Tokyo has many, many, many strategic partnerships. It is a big university. <laughs> Princeton is a relatively small university, and we have three strategic partnerships. Um, and the the partnership with the University of Tokyo, is certainly um, uh, the consensus is that that is the strongest and the most valuable uh, of those uh, partnerships at the at Princeton University. And it's been just a tremendous pleasure to work with colleagues here to develop uh, the collaborative efforts that the partnership supports to actually, after two and a half years of the pandemic, to meet face to face with my colleagues. Um, as Professor Haneda mentioned, we have talked to each other many, many times on Zoom over the past couple of years, but it was a real pleasure to meet uh, in person finally. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And along with that, um, I've had the opportunity to develop some collaborative relationships. We will be having a joint postdoctoral fellowship together, which is a, a, you know, a truly unique and wonderful opportunity. Um, I've had many opportunities to develop new relationships with colleagues here, including with Professor Konishi, who will um, share some thoughts after the talk. So <clears throat> all, all in all, this has been a wonderful six months, uh, seven months. Excuse me. Um, so before I jump in to my talk, one more thing I would like to just say by way of introduction. Um, so uh, Professor Haneda introduced me as a sociologist, which is true, but at the same time, I think I'm primarily would identify myself as a demographer. And that the reason that I want to say that uh, or share that up front is that I understand that demography is a very, very minor discipline everywhere, um, perhaps particularly so in Japan, where I don't even think that there is a program, a graduate program that provides systematic training in, in demography. So I understand that the disciplinary perspectives that I bring to the conversation today uh, may not be familiar. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Um, but I'm sure that the issues that I talk about will be very familiar um, to all of you. And I hope that the uh, uh, perspective, the way that a demographer thinks about things like family change and inequality uh, is compelling and interesting uh, to everybody. So with that, I think I would like to start the slideshow. Okay. Um, yes. Um, the the title includes something that no one will have heard of diverging destinies that's a sort of a demographer's jargon term um, but i will define that for you uh, i think the important thing to keep in mind is that the first part of the title should be self-explanatory this is a talk about family and inequality in japan and what i really want to do is to try to position the relationship between family change and inequality in broad international comparative frameworks for thinking about these relationships. And then I would like to transition to um, a sharing of some ongoing research that I'm doing around these issues. Um, I am not going to answer these questions with any um, rigor or finality. <laughs> um, but I do want to show you some of the work that I'm engaged in <clears throat> because I hope that it is uh, uh, interesting to you in the context of these broader conversations. <clears throat> um, so um, here is a, a slide with a lot of terms that I know will look familiar to probably everybody in the audience. The original slide, <clears throat> excuse me again, sorry. The original slide for this. Um, version of this slide had a lot of book covers, um, Shinsho book covers. Um, but I, I, I was worried about copyright um, <laughs> infringement, so I just changed it to the terms. But what I, the point I want to make here is that all of these terms are central to the research that I do, but they are also terms that all of you are familiar with. And if you walked into any bookstore, I can promise you that you would find at least a dozen, probably two dozen, maybe even three dozen um, Shinsho books with this in the, these terms in the title. You could pick up any week's worth of um, newspapers or magazines, and I promise you, you would see these terms over and over again. So uh, this is all to say that the issues around inequality and particularly their intersection with family, so for example, child poverty or, or family poverty, uh, are, are things that are widely discussed, widely recognized to be important social and policy issues. So with that background, what I want to do, as I just said a minute ago, is to share with you how a demographer thinks about these things and how we go about trying to understand relationships, as I said, between family change and these issues. Um, uh, that's a term that doesn't really have a good English translation, but I guess, you know, unequal society, poverty, inequality, um, child poverty, 
uh, intergenerational transmission of disadvantage, something that we're very, very interested in. And I will talk about more uh, as we go forward. So when I give this, uh, not this talk, but when I give related talks on family and inequality in the Japanese context to audiences in the United States or Europe or elsewhere, uh, I, I think members of the audience are often surprised. I think people have a uh, sense that Japan is a relatively equal, um, low poverty country. Um, I realize that this audience is largely based in Japan, maybe not everybody, but many, and you won't be surprised um, to know that Japan is actually a relatively unequal country. Um, not, not certainly like the United States, <laughs> unequal, that's extreme, um, but Japan um, has higher than average uh, income inequality as measured by the conventional Gini coefficient. So, and when I say higher than average, I mean higher than other high income OECD countries. Uh, similarly, the relative poverty rate, um, a measure of deprivation, economic deprivation, is also above the OECD average with 15.7% of households falling below the um, relative poverty line. Child poverty is also above the OECD average with 14% of children in Japan living in households that fall below the relative poverty line. And I don't have data on the last one, <clears throat> But um, there are many people, including some wonderful scholars here at the University of Tokyo, who have done work on uh, perceptions of inequality and perceptions of opportunity. And I think it's clear that there is evidence that there is a belief uh, in Japan, um, not universal, but a widely shared belief that inequality has increased and that social mobility has decreased. So this is just more background. Um, we will get to the demography in a minute. Um, but a little bit more background. Um, you, you might um, ask, okay, well, all, all of this is good and fine. And yes, we're interested um, in this for a variety of reasons. But why do social scientists care about this? Why do policymakers care about this? Why is this important? Why do we want to better understand um, with some kind of empirical rigor and theoretical rigor, why or how, why and how family change and inequality are related? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons, um, primarily policy reasons. And I think the obvious uh, points are poverty and inequality are expensive. <laughs> um, higher levels of poverty, higher levels of inequality to the extent that uh, they elicit uh, policy responses, costly policy responses uh, designed to ameliorate uh, these issues, for example, um, public income transfers um, and so on, are, are costly. And to the extent that they are costly, that obviously implies some trade-offs uh, with money, resources of various kinds, human resources, uh, physical resources, social resources, financial resources uh, that are dedicated to ameliorating uh, poverty and inequality or mitigating, not ameliorating, mi mitigating <clears throat> um, poverty and inequality. Well, that's, those are resources that are not available to be used for other policy uh, goals. So I think that this is uh, of obvious importance when thinking about policy priorities and finite resources. Um, I also think uh, that the potential implications, um, the sort of feedback implications, if you will, for family formation are particularly important to think about in the context of a country like Japan that has been characterized by very low fertility for a long time. We all know that low fertility is the primary reason that Japan is the oldest country in the world, uh, the oldest country in human history, uh, in fact, at, at least for a while before Korea catches up. Um, we know that's due <clears throat> to low fertility, long periods of low fertility. And we know that low fertility is largely driven by low levels of marriage, union formation, family formation. And we also know that issues like uh, employment instability, low wages, um, uh, limited uh, prospects of uh, wage growth, these are all things that are associated with a reduced likelihood of marriage, family formation, childbearing. So to the extent that we have this sort of feedback between poverty, growing poverty and inequality generated perhaps by family behaviors, 
um, to family formation, then you get in this kind of vicious cycle um, that uh, has obvious uh, broad implications for uh, Japanese society uh, in general. And I think it's also important at a more, uh, maybe a little bit fuzzier level, but equally important level, is to think about relationships between rising inequality, poverty, um, uh, for example, uh, with social cohesion. Um, so there's a lot of research that seeks to evaluate uh, the degrees of objective measures of inequality or subjective measures of social mobility uh, with social exclusion, social cohesion, uh, and so on. And to the extent that social cohesion is uh, associated with uh, a variety of outcomes that we care about, um, uh, uh, crime might be an example, um, then again, this is something that we want to be concerned about in a broader picture sense. So hopefully that is useful in laying out the big picture, um, both in a general and a more um, specific sense. Uh, explanations for growing inequality and poverty uh, in Japan. This is social science. Um, I'm, we demographers don't do chemistry. We don't do physics. Um, there are no simple, clean answers. Um, social science is messy. And there are many explanations and none of them are independent of others. I think we need to consider the variety of explanations in their totality, recognizing the interrelationships among them. Um, economic stagnation is clearly a critically important component. Um, we all know that Japan is now in what decade three of low um, uh, economic growth, wage stagnation, and so on. Um, this has been accompanied by growth in non-standard employment. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about sort of a bifurcation of the labor market into regular uh, stable employment and non-standard uh, part-time uh, and other types of uh, employment. Uh, tax system, <clears throat> you know, one way that we um, respond to growing levels of poverty and inequality is to change uh, redistribution policies. Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, Japan does not do a bad job uh, in terms of mitigating um, pre-tax uh, and transfer uh, inequality to lower levels of post-tax and transfer inequality, but it's certainly not the most um, generous country on that front. Um, a weak social safety net, again. And here, uh, I think uh, about things like uh, avail uh, uh, um, eligibility for welfare. Uh, um, eligibility for welfare, uh, becoming eligible for welfare receipt in Japan, certainly that has increased dramatically over time, but I think it's also arguably true that it is one of the hardest countries, um, uh, uh, policy environments, I should say, uh, for people to qualify for welfare benefits, um, at least among the um, high income countries. So those are a few economic explanations and policy explanations. Population aging is another key explanation. Um, again, we know Japan is an old country. We know it's become more old over time. And we also know that um, income inequality and poverty is highest uh, among the older population. And this is just a simple compositional story. The greater the representation of the older population in the overall population, the more unequal the society will be, the higher the poverty rates will be. There, was, uh, several, there were several papers, really nice papers in the 90s written on this, primarily by economists. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the work of um, Fumio Otake at uh, uh, Osaka University, who wrote some really nice um, papers on this very demographic explanation for rising inequality. And what I wanna talk about today is another demographic uh, focus, family bifurcation, family change, okay? And that's what I wanna spend the next several minutes um, describing. Um, how demographers um, think about, understand, and study family change with an eye to inequality. <clears throat> um, and I'm gonna talk about, in this context, I'm gonna talk about the diverging destinies framework. What is it? Um, what do we know about diverging destinies in Japan? I'll tell you the answer now, not much. Um, and what is its evidence for, what is the evidence uh, for diverging destinies having a role in growing inequality, both within and across generations uh, in, in Japan? And again, the answer here is 
Um, there's not much evidence because there hasn't been much research done on this, but we are working to try to um, fill that gap uh, to some degree. So this term diverging destinies was first used um, by a colleague of mine at Princeton who um, very unfortunately passed away last year, Sarah McClanahan. Um, and the um, paper on the left, you're, you're right, my left, um, is uh, her uh, presidential address to the Population Association of America, uh, which Professor Haneda mentioned mentioned in my introduction uh, in 2004. And this is when she introduced this idea of diverging destinies, how children are faring under the second demographic transition. I won't spend a lot of time talking about the second demographic transition, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. But this is a profoundly important paper and set of ideas. You can see over 1,700 uh, citations to date. Um, I, if there are some psychologists in the audience, you'll laugh. <laughs> 1,700 citations, that's nothing. <laughs> but for social scientists and demographers, that's a lot. Um, 1,700 is an is a indication of a very uh, profoundly important um, paper. And um, in this 2004 paper, she sort of laid out the ideas. And one of the key points she made in that paper was because this idea of diverging destinies in her estimation was part of a broader set of social and demographic changes that we call the second demographic transition, we should expect to see with variation the same pattern. Um, so S Sarah McClanahan was a, a scholar of the United States. She studied family inequality in the United States for, for decades. And, and this is where this emerged. But her argument was that we should expect to see this pattern that we observe in the United States in other countries uh, as well, because it's part of this broader set of social and demographic changes. And, and she provided some initial evidence and followed up in 2015, I, I, I think it's 2016, 2015, this, this book here on the right um, uh, or left, um, she followed up with additional empirical information suggesting that the patterns of diverging destinies have been emerging in many countries other than the United States. So what is diverging destinies? I've used the term several times. I've promised to define it several times. So let's define it. Um, this is a graph that I always use in um, presenting on diverging destinies, especially to audiences for whom the term may not be familiar. But it's a very simple stylized representation of social change. And the, there is nothing real about this graph. These are all made up data. Um, no, no data in real life look like this, do they? <laughs> um, too clean, um, but uh, it, it's made up. Um, but basically what you have here is on the horizontal axis, um, I'm not sure if this is gonna, uh, probably not gonna work. You have time, um, some measure of calendar time. And on the vertical axis, you have the prevalence of some family outcome of interest, a family outcome critically that's linked to children's resources. So let's just say for the sake of argument that this graph, the vertical axis is the percent of um, mothers who had a non-marital birth, who gave birth to a child outside of marriage, okay? And the basic idea here is that we have different measures of socioeconomic status. Let's say high, black, middle, yellow, uh, low, red. This could be income. Most likely it's educational attainment, mother's educational attainment. So in Japan, low might be high school or less, yellow junior college and vocational school, and black would be uh, university and graduate school. So the idea is that at some point in the past, the level of this family behavior, non-marital childbearing, was low. Um, here about 5%. And more importantly, the socioeconomic differences were small. And over time, as part of this demographic change that we call the second demographic transition, non-marital childbearing increased for all groups, increased across the board. But the key point is it increased, it increased more quickly for women at the bottom of the socioeconomic distribution than at the top. So you have this kind of bifurcation or fanning out, if you will, of family behavior. And again, to repeat, the key thing here is that these are family behaviors that we know 
from either theory or more importantly, empirical research are linked to children's resources. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers demonstrating that for a variety of reasons, children born outside of marital unions fare less well on a lot of outcomes we care about. Um, but it doesn't have to be family change associated with uh, worse outcomes. It could be better outcomes. So for example, um, the vertical axis uh, might be stable maternal employment, which in most cases we know or think we know to be associated with better outcomes for children. Mothers who are stably employed across the lives of their children tend to have better outcomes for those children. The graph would look just the same, except the red would be highly educated or high SES, um, increasing faster. And the uh, black would be low SES, increasing, but at a more slow pace, but still this bifurcation with implications for divergence in children's resources and by extension, their life opportunities or destinies. This is what we refer to as diverging destinies, okay? This link between socioeconomic bifurcation in family behavior, growing disparities in children's resources with implications for their future well being, and importantly, the reproduction of inequality across generations. Okay, so I mentioned two um, behaviors uh, non marital childbearing and stable maternal employment. However, it's important to keep in mind that the family behaviors of interest, um, that is family behaviors we know, or again, think we know to be related to children's resources are abundant. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole list here, but you can look at them. Um, divorce is a great example. I'll provide some data on that later. Um, early versus late <clears throat> childbearing. We'll provide some data, I'll provide some data uh, on that later. Yes, I will. Okay. Um, and a variety of other um, outcomes, unintended versus intended childbearing, for example. Um, so a broad range uh, of, of family uh, outcomes of interest. So um, what do we know about diverging destinies in Japan? Well, I would argue that there is an awful lot of research on socioeconomic differences in family behavior in Japan. So that graph I just showed you with the made up data we could replicate that for a lot of outcomes over a lot of different periods of time based on research on family change in Japan. Um, we have that part. Um, there's some limited research on socioeconomic differences in children's outcomes. We know that children of higher educated parents or higher earning parents tend to do better on various outcomes in Japan as they do in other countries. That's no surprise. Um, the issue here is there's not a lot of research on this. So we know less about this in Japan than we do in other countries. And I think the primary reason for that is limited data on children's outcomes. Um, uh, th there's a lot of data, but I'm, I'm talking about population data. Demographers want population representative data. Um, and those um, studies, large population representative survey data sets, and those are not so easy to come by. There's some research on family behavior and children's outcomes. Um, I'll include some of my own here on divorce. There are several papers describing the extreme disadvantage faced by single mothers um, in Japan as a result of divorce, and by extension, the disadvantages that their children face. So we have these pieces, okay? Piece one, piece two, piece three. What we don't have is an effort to bring all of this together in a broad, comprehensive, widely understood and shared comparative theoretical framework like diverging destinies. And that's kind of what I see my <laughs> mission to be is to try to um, provide some of that work, um, not, not by myself, but with colleagues um, uh, who work with me on these uh, issues. Um, I would argue that there are many reasons to expect diverging destinies to be of, of really little relevance, limited relevance in Japan. One of the uh, key explanations that McClanahan offers in her research for this pattern of diverging destinies is an emphasis on growing gender um, equality. So her argument is that more egalitarian attitudes and behaviors among particularly those at the higher levels of socioeconomic status really support the family behaviors that we know to be associated with children's well-being and 
the difference in that those changes in gender attitudes and behavior uh, across the socioeconomic spectrum contribute to this bifurcation. That I think is probably of limited relevance in Japan because even though gender attitudes and behavior are changing uh, slowly in Japan, I, I think it's safe to say that this is one of the most gender inegalitarian rich countries. I, I don't think anybody will argue with me on that. Um, so to the extent that gender equality and the growth of feminism and so on is important for diverging destinies, maybe that's not so central or salient to the Japanese case. Another is the history of a very homogeneous family life force. Um, people, demographers have written on this for years. Um, the existence of terms like uh, tekideki or Christmas cakes or something. I know these are old, old, outdated, completely outdated terms, but the fact that these terms existed not so long ago um, uh, when I was a, a young student um, suggests that there are widely shared norms and expect have been widely shared norms and expectations of a homogeneous family life force. And to the extent that there is some remnant of that today, maybe there's not, but to the extent that there is some, then that's another reason to not expect um, diverging destinies to be of much importance. There are reasons to expect diverging destinies to be of great relevance in Japan, particularly the weak social safety net that I talked about earlier, the tendency to expect um, families to be the primary um, source of support or last resort. Well, I guess the public support is the last resort. Families are the first resort um, for family members uh, in need. Um, in my own work, for example, this is reflected in the very high percentage of divorced women who return to co-reside with their parents or the grandparents of their children. Um, also, the rapidly changing labor market. I mentioned this earlier, the rapid growth in bad jobs, what we call bad jobs in the United States, non-standard employment um, uh, without uh, benefits, low pay, and so on. Um, at the same time that we have increasing economic and employment opportunities for well-educated women. So to the extent that you have a bifurcation in labor market opportunities, socioeconomic bifurcation, and to the extent that, that those socioeconomic circumstances, um, labor force market, labor market circumstances are related to family behaviors, then that's another reason to expect diverging destinies to be relevant. So I said that there hasn't been much. This is just a, 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 a kind of, um, a, not an advertisement, but just a note um, that uh, I have tried to do this in a very preliminary way with a colleague, uh, Miho Iwasawa, um, who works at the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research here in Tokyo, where we tried to use um, long uh, you know, historical data over the past 20, 30 years I'm sitting next to a historian and he said, that's not historical data. <laughs> that's, that's the current data. But for us, it's, it's at least recent historical data. Um, and we tried to examine the extent to which there was um, uh, bifurcation in these behaviors listed um, on the left of the book. And I won't show you all of these because we find in some cases, there is no evidence of bifurcation, non-marital childbearing, for example. But one example that really stands out is vital pregnancy, is what the demographers call it. We used to call it um, uh, shotgun marriage in the United States. I don't like that term. And typically is referred to as dekichatta um, kekkon in Japan or, yeah. Um, so this is uh, a figure based on national data for women born in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the vertical axis is the predicted probability that these women were pregnant at the time they got married, married. So they had a premarital pregnancy that led to marriage. And you can see this looks just like the figure I showed you, except a little bumpier, of course, because it's real data. Um, the blue is junior high school graduates, so high school dropouts. Please ignore that. Um, this is a small, very unusual group. It's there for the sake of completeness. But please look at the red and the gray, high school graduates and vocational school graduates and compare their trajectory over time with junior college and university graduates, yellow and black. And you can see this fanning out or bifurcation with respect to bridal pregnancy. And you might be asking, well, this is about resources, right? Is bridal pregnancy really related to children's resources? Um, 
Good question. Um, maybe, maybe not. But I think that we know that bridal pregnancy tends to be um, relatively early childbearing, and most importantly, tends to be unintended. These tend to be unplanned pregnancies that, that resulted in marriage. And to the extent that research on children's outcomes from planned and versus unplanned pregnancies uh, in the US and elsewhere applies to Japan, well, I think the answer is yes. This is something that we think might have implications for children's resources and be a real good example of family change linked to diverging destinies in the Japan Japanese case. So let me transition now, what I have about 15 minutes or so um, left, which is good timing. I wanna spend a little bit of time um, talking not about things that, at a, not about things at a general level or not about things that I've already published, but things that are, we're working on right now or have published very, very recently. And I'll, I'll try to walk you through these um, figures, all of which focus on socioeconomic, particularly educational differences in family behavior. And I wanna think about them in the context of this story that I've been telling about diverging destinies as a plausible explanation or part of a broader complex explanation for growing inequality, poverty in Japan. So what this shows is for relatively recent marriages, marriages that took place in 1995 to 2015, first marriages, for high school, left, junior college, vocational school, middle, university, graduate school on the right. This is the distribution of women's, so wives, pathways to marriage. And the gray part is the conventional pathway to marriage. You get engaged, get married, become pregnant or not, have a child or not, conventional pathway to marriage, uh, family formation. The orange is marriages that were preceded by cohabitation, a period of living together unmarried, uh, the wife living with her future husband, but prior to marriage. And the orange, so the, the light orange and the dotted orange, these are bridal pregnancies. These are uh, marriages that were preceded by pregnancy, okay? And you can see that for high school graduates in these recent marriages, about half, a little over half, followed the conventional pathway to marriage, and about half did not. Um, this is a much higher level of non-conventional pathways to marriage, particularly marriages preceded by pregnancy compared to the highly educated. You'll see 66% uh, followed the conventional path, and compared to the 19% of women who married while pregnant uh, among high school graduates, only 8% of university graduates married while pregnant. So this is some suggestive evidence of not change, but cross-section, recent marriages, suggesting uh, a strong educational gradient in uh, family behaviors that we think may be related to children's resources. Okay, that's one. Um, what about divorce? This is from uh, a different paper that I'm working on right now, um, based on uh, a, a series of surveys collected by the Japan Institute for Labor Policy and Training. It's a, uh, a think tank associated with the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. And this is in collaboration with a graduate student, Jia Wang, at uh, the University of Wisconsin. And basically, these are mothers. The sample is mothers. And the vertical axis here is the percent of mothers, national sample, representative sample, the percent who have ever divorced, who report ever having experienced divorce. So the lowest education group, about a fourth of women have ever divorced. And that's about what we think overall levels of divorce in Japan are. And you can see a very clear negative gradient. That's three times higher than the percent of university graduate, uh, university educated mothers who have experienced divorce. So we know, we don't think in this case, we know in this case that divorce is unambiguously related to children's resources, mother's resources and children's resources. And um, uh, this is clearly evidence, again, not of change, but of uh, behavioral differences consistent with what we would expect in the diverging destinies framework. Um, this is a current paper, but this has been documented over and over 
um, and is, is very well understood in the Japanese context and in many, many other places, it looks just like this. Um, here, I mentioned stable employment earlier. This is a, a picture from the same study using the same data. And what we tried to do here was to characterize mothers' labor force trajectories or labor force stability, employment stability around first birth. So this is a classification of employment status one year before first birth, one year after first birth. The blue bars represent women who were out of the labor market, not working, one year after the birth of their first child. Um, gray is a mix of things. Um, orange is what I want you to pay attention to here. These are women who were either who were employed either stably full-time, dark orange, or stably part-time, light orange, here. And you can see 15% of women with a high school or less uh, education were stably employed. It's 27% among university educated women. Um, two things to take from this slide. One is that this is very, very low levels of stable employment <laughs> relative to other countries, but we know that. Um, and, and this is, this is uh, an important thing to think about, we can talk about later. But the other thing to take from this, again, is that we see clear differences between uh, mothers uh, with higher levels of education and those with lower levels of education with respect to a family behavior we know, um, or at least in the Japanese case, think to be associated with children's resources and subsequent well-being. Um, here's, I apologize to all of you in the audience who don't work with quantitative data, who don't work with statistical analytical methods, but I'll do my very, very best to explain this really clearly. What we wanna do is to move from mother's behavior to an explicit focus on resources. So what we've done is to take four measures of economic resources in this survey, low income. So I can describe how I measure that later, but being in the lower part of the income distribution. Economic need, um, reporting that you are unable to buy necessary food or clothing at some point. Subjective difficulty, um, finances are tough. Um, uh, in, yeah, finances are tough, subjective um, economic difficulty. Inability to save, people who can't save on a regular basis or report spending down savings. And these blue bars represent differences, okay? They represent differences with high school educated mothers, okay? Um, and you can see, if you look at the um, vertical axis, these are all negative, okay? which I want you to understand means that the probability of reporting low income, economic need, subjective difficulty, inability to save, these four measures of disadvantage is lower among women with a vocational junior college, university education compared to women, mothers with a high school education, okay? So again, this is consistent with the patterns we see. And all of these are large and meaningful. So for example, with low income, university educated mothers are 18 percentage points, have 18 percentage points lower likelihood of reporting low income um, on this. The question we wanna ask is when we move from these simple descriptions, these simple differences, and we account in a statistical sense for differences in divorce and differences in stable employment that I just showed you, I just showed you that highly educated women less likely to divorce and more likely to be stably employed around first birth. To what extent do those differences explain away or account for these differences in economic disadvantage? So when we estimate those models, we get the orange bars. They're all shorter, um, less negative. So in other words, differences in divorce and stable employment that I showed you in the previous slides account for part of the educational differences in these measures of economic disadvantage. About a third, a quarter to a third of the difference can be explained, at least in a statistical accounting sense, by these differences in behavior. This is sort of exactly what we would expect to see uh, in the context of the diverging destinies um, framework. These are not measures of children's resources, but they are pretty good proxies, I would argue, of children's economic resources within the family. 
um, very briefly in the last um, five or six minutes, um, a few more slides on differences across groups in now explicit measures of children's uh, well being. In particular, here, school performance. These are based on, this is published in a journal a couple of years ago with the same uh, student, Jiao Wang. Um, and these are from data uh, collected at Keio University, uh, the Japan Child Panel Survey, which is a, a wonderful resource. I, I mentioned earlier, there aren't many national surveys on children's well being. This is one of them, and it's a wonderful resource. And this is basically just description here, no model. Um, and these are the mean values of children's performance on math tests, Japanese tests, kanji tests basically, and reasoning or logic tests. And here I'm not looking at educational differences, but household income. Blue is in the lowest 25%, gray, the middle 50%, and no, orange, sorry, orange, orange, <laughs> the middle 50% and gray, the top 25%. And the mean for the entire sample for these um, test scores is zero, okay? So the mean is zero. And what you can see very clearly is that children whose parents have low levels of income fare less well than those in the middle and much, much less well than those whose parents have higher levels of income on all three tests. So this shouldn't be surprising. I think we know this from many, many studies. Um, the, the real question is, can we link this to family behavior? But I wanted to show you some of these results. Here's another one um, where we look at um, family behavior, not family behavior, problem behavior, behavior problem, sorry. Um, so acting out and um, fighting and talking back and things like that. It's a big index of children's behavior problems. So the higher the value on this, the, this is not mean zero, this is just a sum. The higher the value, the more behavior problems. And you can see again, that behavior problems are higher among children um, in low income households relative to those in high income households. So you see this part of that puzzle, um, that diverging destinies puzzle um, looking very much like it does in other settings. So here's one last data slide, one last data slide. Um, where we try to put all this together. And this is a paper that I'm working on right now and will actually present on in a couple of, uh, sometime next month, I believe, um, also with my favorite student, Jiao Wang. <laughs> um, uh, she's engaged in a lot of this work with me. And here we're trying to ask and answer the question, um, are there differences in early childbearing across socioeconomic groups in Japan? And are those differences salient for understanding differences in children's outcomes, okay? And this is a really interesting question in my view as a demographer, because there's almost no early childbearing as we understand early childbearing in the US and elsewhere. Um, we think about early childbearing as teenage childbearing or age 20 or something like that. That's almost zero in Japan. Um, so the real question of interest is, in a country like Japan or Korea or Italy or elsewhere, where there's almost no <laughs> early childbearing as we understand it, do these same patterns hold? Um, uh, I think this is a really powerful test of these broad ideas. And what we can see here is the distribution of age at first childbirth. So high school, junior college, vocational school and university, again, blue is early, younger birth. This is 24 and below, age 24 and below. Um, orange is 25 to 29, gray is 30 and above for first birth. And you can see, yes, there's a gradient. 17% of the least educated women had a birth at 24 age, years of age or younger compared to only four. So what, four times higher uh, among those in the lower uh, educational group. And okay, so that's interesting. And critically, what we also see using those same Japan child panel survey data is that children whose mothers had their first birth at younger ages have significantly lower scores. Here's the math score, but we can look at other outcomes as well, but significantly lower math scores than children whose mothers had their births at average normative ages and much lower than those whose mothers had their first birth at older ages. That's an interesting finding. 
Um, but again, this is a, an attempt to sort of put all these pieces together and to try to document socioeconomic differences in family behavior and to try to link those family behaviors to children's resources or children's outcomes in an effort to understand the possible connection between family change, systematic family change, and inequality and, and growing levels of poverty. So I have what, about five, four or five minutes left taking all of my time. So I will go through these last slides very quickly um, so that we have more time for conversation and uh, questions. Um, basically, this slide just says that there are a lot of reasons to be interested in linkages between family behavior and inequality in Japan. There are important reasons to think that these broad frameworks like diverging destinies are not really all that helpful in a context like Japan, but there are also reasons to think they may be extremely informative in the Japanese context. And my job, I see, as a social scientist um, engaged in these kinds of questions is to systematically and carefully um, bring the Japanese case into these broader conversations um, through the careful empirical analysis of population data, which is what we're trying to do. Um, so um, I, I won't go through this because I've really already tried to say this. Um, the one thing I guess I will highlight here is that um, something that Professor Haneda and I were talking about before the presentation is, is that I think there's often a tendency um, in, in Japan, um, and I, maybe this is true of every country, to think that that country is somehow different and somehow distinct and somehow hard to understand in the context of broad comparative theoretical frameworks for understanding social change and its implications. Um, I, I would argue that based on all of the data that we have, Japan is a, a very normal country um, with respect to many features of this framework. One major, major exception that we didn't talk much about, and that is the continued strength of the relationship between marriage and childbearing. I talked about the low levels of non-marital childbearing in Japan. I talked about the high prevalence of bridal pregnancy. That is, um, when one finds oneself pregnant, unplanned, um, one gets married or aborts um, the, the pregnancy. And that absence of an emergence of non-marital childbearing as a pathway to family formation in Japan is a critically important difference. Um, and uh, I have a little bit of things to say about where we go from here, but basically uh, all I really wanna say is that I think that we want to continue pursuing um, empirical evaluation of these questions um, in Japan, also bringing in the Korean, the Taiwanese context to try to understand how we make sense of regional, um, regionally distinctive features that may be helpful for understanding these questions um, in the broader perspective. So my time is up, so I will stop now um, so that we can hand off, literally hand off the uh, uh, baton um, to Professor Konichi, uh, whose comments I am eager to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Raimo, for your very interesting and stimulating lecture. I personally didn't know the uh, term concept of uh, diversing, uh, di diversing, no, uh, like, yeah, yeah, diversing, diversing, diversing yeah, destinies. Yeah, yeah. Um, it proves that I didn't know the term. But then, <laughs> you, you weren't supposed to know the term. Yeah, it's, it's diversing <laughs> destinies, but uh, uh, it's quite interesting to uh, explain something related to inequality, a family inequality, by using this concept. Yeah. And uh, uh, today, um, although I'm not a uh, professional uh, demographer or a professional scientist related to his uh, Professor Lemus field, I, uh, we have a wonderful uh, commentator, Professor Konishi Shoko, uh, with us. Uh, she is associate professor at the Department of Human Ecology at uh, the School of Medicine at the University of Tokyo. Uh, she organizes a cooperative research group on the fecundity, that is, interdisciplinary investigation of technology, environment, and fertility. So she is certainly a competent person uh, for making comments on Professor Lehm's lecture. 
And during his uh, and during her comments, please send send us uh, your comments and uh, questions to the Professor Lehman's lectures. We have already received some, but uh, you can send it in Japanese as well. Nihongo demo kekko desu. Dozo. Takusan sitemon o yose kudasai. Now uh, it's your turn, Professor Konishi. Thank you very much, Professor Haneda, for the introduction. And thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Professor Raymo. Um, and I appreciate uh, Professor Raymo, Professor Haneda, and all the Tokyo College staff members for giving me this precious opportunity to give comments. And uh, my own research is about biological and behavioral correlates of low fertility in Japan. And I am interested in why we have such low fertility. Mm. And I suspect underlying mechanisms <laughs> may be different across countries and also between Japan and the Western countries. So um, I would like to start from discussing how Japan might differ from the Western countries especially in terms of diverging destiny. Mm -hmm. So um, Professor Sarah McLenhan, uh, Professor Raymond mentioned in his talk, uh, argued that the second demographic transition led to diverging destinies of mothers and children. Uh, but I wonder whether Japan has already experienced the second demographic transition. So I would like to hear what you think about this. Yeah. And if not yet, do we expect to experience it in the near future? And the second demographic transition is characterized by four major shifts. Among the four, delays in fertility and marriage, increases in marital cohabitation and divorce, and convergence in gender roles. These happened in Japan, yeah. but maybe not the last one, yeah. childbearing yeah. outside marriage. And I am curious to know how could these differences in the second demographic transition be linked with the characteristics of DD yeah. in Japan? So as Professor Raymond also mentioned in his talk, marriage and childbearing are strongly linked in Japan. Uh, bridal pregnancy is common because childbearing is expected to happen within marriage, but many single women do become pregnant. Uh, while some of such pregnancies result in either birth or abortion, Uh, now, while some of such pregnancies result in marriage and childbearing, many other pregnancies end in abortion. Right. And premarital pregnancy is becoming the major reason for marriage. So in other words, uh, marriage that is not preceded by pregnancy is becoming less common. And uh, the other side of the strong link between marriage and childbearing are infertility. <clears throat> so many married couples are under the pressure to have children. And in this country, fertility treatment is uh, very common and now covered by national insurance, which uh, could even strengthen the pressure for couples trying to conceive. So um, I would like to ask Professor Raymo, uh, how could DD may affect infertility risks and also the treatment seeking behavior for infertility? Right. And now I would like to suggest a potential framework for the analysis. 
So it is related to your suggestion of constellation of family behaviors. Uh, you have plenty of data showing that DD does affect quality of marriage and children. And it will be interesting to study how could DD affect the likelihood of getting married and having children with life, history, life trajectory data. So who are more likely to become pregnant and who are more likely to marry? And how is it related to DD? So they would be interesting questions uh, to pursue in future studies. And I know modeling is difficult, uh, but probabilities of transitions from one state to another, for example, from singlehood to marriage, would uh, be considered together with the quality of marriage. Mm -hmm. So similarly, probabilities of becoming pregnant and giving birth can be considered together with the characteristics or the quality of children. So there may be a trade-off or there may be trade-offs between the probability of transition and the quality at one state. Mm -hmm. So which could also be evaluated in this analytical framework. Mm -hmm. And I have several <clears throat> comments on the data about parental income and children's school performance and prob problematic behavior. Uh, I think the variation within each income group is important mm -hmm. and worth investigating. Yeah. So, for example, uh, we would like to know who does well at school while having low-income parents. Uh, since children cannot change their parents' educational status, uh, we need to know how we can mitigate or minimize adverse effects of DD. And when we think about the broader impacts of DD on population across generations, the important question is how does a major like school performance or problematic behavior during childhood uh, relate to their reproduction and family behavior in the future? And this is my final slice. So here are some more questions. So um, uh, characteristics and the social meaning of university graduates changing. So because in Japan, more than a half of high school graduates entered universities in 2020. So maybe the meaning of university graduates itself has yes. changed. Yes. And the second? Uh, are there any measures in which disparities decreased but not increased between high and low educated? And the final question is about the strong link between marriage and childbearing. So is it due to our social norm or is it rather related to Japanese policy or is it related to something else? So this is my final question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Konishi, for your very interesting uh, uh, comments and questions. Now it's your turn, Professor Emo, uh, to answer uh, our okay. question. Respond. Um, so, wonderful comments. Thank you. Um, there is so much there, um, and so much uh, really uh, insightful questions that there's no possible way. I can answer all of them, but I will try to briefly respond to some of the key points, and maybe we can um, use that as a starting point for some conversation. So maybe going in reverse order, um, I, I think the point that you make about changing meaning of educational attainment is, is absolutely critical. So this is a story about uh, change in the behavior of high SES and low SES groups. And you are 100% correct 
to think that educational change means that what was low SES in the past may not, or what was high SES in the past may not be high SES today and, and so on. Um, and, and this is particularly important, you know, as you suggested in thinking about what happens when uh, now 50% of the population attends higher education. Uh, I work a lot with scholars in Korea where it's even more extreme. 70% of young people go to four-year universities. And, and how can that even be a useful measure um, with which to distinguish socioeconomic groups um, in the way we used to? And, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, one, one possibility that another student um, is working with uh, is to think about the um, status or selectivity uh, of colleges. So let's just imagine in Korea or Japan someday, 100% um, of people go to college. <laughs> then what do we do? Um, well, we could use income or we could use occupation or we could do things like that. Or we could think about making gradations within higher education between lower status, uh, private schools, elite schools, and so on. Um, but that's a really important question that I think is very hard to deal with. Um, in McClanahan's own work, developing the diverging destinies ideas, she used relative education. So we have a distribution of years of education, the bottom third, middle third, top third, but that's really hard to do with a lot of surveys um, that don't ask years of education. And it's impossible to do with uh, when everybody gets the same years of education, 16. Um, so that's a really uh, important point. Um, the, a couple of other important points, just, just to note, one thing that you said that really resonates with me as an important sort of future direction is life outcomes. The, the term diverging destinies Destiny is about the future, right? I mean, that, that's a, um, uh, an indication that these patterns that we're observing happening today should have implications for inequality down the road. Um, and we're looking at middle school test scores um, or middle school behavioral problems. That is not down the road. That is not destinies. That's today. So you're absolutely correct in thinking that that is an important next step. And in the field of sociology, of course, we have a major investment in trying to understand um, life course outcomes. And I think that I can easily imagine diverging destinies and the life course, <laughs> or the life course and diverging destinies being the title of several papers uh, in the future where we do exactly what you're <laughs> suggesting. Another uh, really important point that you raise is about inter country level differences. And I, I made the point that I think Japan is a pretty normal country with one big exception that you also highlighted, the very, very low levels of non-marital childbearing. And because non-marital childbearing is so central to the diverging destinies framework, understanding why that's the case in Japan, Taiwan, Korea, China, um, but not in other conservative gender unequal places with strong family um, uh, emphases like Portugal, Spain, Italy. Um, what is it? Um, and, and I don't have an answer to that. I think the people who have done research on this have really emphasized a, a few things, one of which is um, a, a sort of fundamental shared understanding that one needs both a mother and a father. Um, mothers and fathers play different roles and children benefit from having mothers and fathers. Um, another person that I talked to recently, um, maybe she's in the audience, maybe not. Um, I really appreciate the suggestion emphasized the importance of establishing paternity. Um, you know, in the US, you can get a, you can get a genetic test and establish paternity. I don't think that's allowed here, I don't, I don't know, um, but that's a possibility. Um, but what's really interesting to me when we think about this is that there is no problem with non-married child rearing. About 10% of households with children in Japan are single parent families. Um, 
So non-marital or single parent child rearing, no problem. I mean, it, I mean, I shouldn't say no problem, it's common, um, but there is a much larger barrier for some reasons um, with respect to the um, non-marital child bearing uh, and really understanding the either policy or social um, normative expectations that go into that uh, is critical. Um, let's see, what else? Um, um, Oh, a great, a great point you made. Two, two great points that I want to briefly address. Um, you asked about how do we think about things like infertility and um, fertility uh, treatment in the context of diverging destinies? How do we think about um, the likelihood of getting married, for example, in the context of diverging destinies? And, and I would argue, um, I'm, I'm going to say two things. One is I don't think it's really relevant to diverging destinies, but it could be very relevant to a closely related set of questions. So what I mean by the first thing about diverging destinies, so this is about children and children's resources and the implications of variation in children's resources for the subsequent as yet unobserved <laughs> life outcomes. Um, but infertility, infertility treatment, marriage, th those are not about children per se, because the children don't exist yet. Um, uh, they could be about siblings. And to the extent that we think that sibling, having siblings or um, having parents who were or were not able to achieve their desires to um, have subsequent children is relevant to children's resources. I don't know how that would be, but that could be relevant. But what I want to argue is that I think that if we take a little bit of a step back and don't focus only on destinies and children, but focus on inequality more broadly, I think the points that you raise uh, about the high levels of infertility and infertility treatment seeking um, is, is critical. Um, if infertility is a measure of inequality, um, that's critical. Um, Marriage is another great example. Um, roughly 30% of men and about 20% of women in Japan are projected to never marry. That's much, much higher than the percent of people who say they don't want to marry. So there is a gap between marital intentions or desires and marriage outcomes. And to the extent that, again, the ability to achieve <laughs> one's desire to marry or not is a measure of inequality, then thinking about the social, economic, political landscape and how it shapes people's, not children's ability, but adults' ability to achieve family outcomes that they desire. Um, that's an important understudied aspect of the linkages between family behavior and inequality. Um, my good friend and colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Hanjun Park, who does a lot of work on the Korean context, he talks about this as the emerging um, view of family as luxury. Family is something that the well-off can have. And, those, and, and that would apply to fertility treatment perhaps as well. Um, and lifelong singlehood and childlessness is something that the um, less well-off are destined to. Um, and to the extent that that is something that we want to pay attention to, I think that's a great extension or side um, focus for this. So I'll, I'll stop there. I can say much, much more, but I want to leave time for others. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any response to, uh, to Professor Raymond's um, answer? I, I do have lots of responses, <laughs> but I would like to give time for the so no, we have received a lot of comments and questions from audience, uh, but, uh, so I, I can't uh, introduce all of them. So I, I'll pick up a couple of them and uh, uh, read uh, questions to Professor Lemo. One, no, no, one, one, is, one comes from uh, uh, one of our postdoc researchers. Uh, I have three questions that I, ho I hope to learn more about. What are some typical examples of countries or regions that are currently going through 
second demographic, second demographic change. The second question for diverging destinies would the link between socioeconomic status and family behaviors work differently in different uh, cultures or communities? Have you seen some paradoxes or opposite examples if there is any? The third one, the uh, graphs of quanti uh, quantita quantitative association between mother's education and other indicators are sad to see, but super interesting. Do we have some similar data for fathers? Ah, These three questions to you. Okay, um, wow, great questions. Um, uh, the first one is easy, two and three are hard. <laughs> so I want to start with the easy one. Um, so what are some um, countries that are currently uh, sort of experiencing the second demographic transition? And, and this was one of um, Professor Konishi's questions at the outset was, you know, should we even think about Japan as a second demographic transition country? And, and I'll just take a, a brief moment to say that the second demographic transition, which I didn't really define, um, is really a framework for understanding the failure to find evidence for the only theory in demography. <laughs> we have one theory. Um, and, and that is that at some point in time, we will have population equilibrium characterized by similar death rates and birth rates. Um, and what we have in most rich countries is very low birth rates, so much lower than um, uh, death rates. So we have uh, low fertility, population aging, and now in some countries like Japan, Korea, Germany, Italy, population decline. Um, so that, that's what second demographic transition is all about. And it really focuses on changes in attitudes, um, a sort of um, uh, move away from uh, behavior shaped by institutional forces and so on to uh, a, a situation or a society in which people pursue their own goals, which may or may not involve family. So that's just a little bit of a, a background for those of you who may not know uh, much about the second demographic transition because I didn't really define it. Um, but there are, are hundreds and hundreds of papers that have been written on this trying to evaluate the um, where people, where not people, where countries fall um, on the, the so-called second demographic transition. And of course, the countries that um, uh, are, are seen as sort of prototypical leaders in, in the second demographic transition are places like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, um, Scandinavia, um, and certainly Western Europe as well, the Netherlands, um, France, and so on. Um, and, and really interesting question uh, about sort of paradoxes or unexpected things. Uh, we never expected um, low or high rates of non-marital childbearing, which are a central feature of the second demographic transition to um, a, a appear in France and uh, not France, Italy and Spain, for example. Um, right now, about 40% of children in Spain born recently born children in Spain are born to unmarried mothers. That compares to two uh, in Japan. So there are a lot of places that are experiencing the second demographic transition or features of the second demographic transition in um, similar but slightly different ways. And I actually just um, this week had a paper accepted um, at a journal that asked the question, <laughs> is the second demographic transition ha happening in Japan? Uh, and if so, how? Um, and my argument was that, um, and I think it was the argument of your first slide, um, uh, in many ways, absolutely. Um, the behavioral and attitudinal changes that are sort of core to the second demographic transition framework, we see almost all of them um, in, in Japan. What we don't see is the um, the disconnect, the um, weakening of the connection between marriage and childbearing. Um, but I think most demographers would argue that, to a greater or lesser degree, um, all most all high income countries are experiencing the second demographic transition in some way or uh, another. Um, I've talked so long that I've almost forgotten the second question, which was about <laughs> diverging destinies um, and whether there was any sort of surprises, I think. Um, I don't really, um, I, I think, I, I, I don't wanna um, 
say things that I, I can't actually verify or I don't actually know for a fact. Um, so I want to be a little bit careful, but I'll say two things uh, on this. Um, the first is that, you know, just as the second demographic transition framework emerged from um, Belgium, Netherlands, Nordic countries, uh, the Diverging Destinies Framework, as I mentioned, um, was developed by Sarah McClanahan, a U.S. researcher based on research on the United States. Um, and I would argue, I, I think with good reason, that very, very few countries have experienced the degree of family bifurcation that the United States has. Um, certainly the patterns that we see in Japan with respect to divorce, I showed you stable uh, maternal employment and so on. Those are not as extreme as they are in the US. And I think that they may be even less extreme in some other um, countries with maybe stronger welfare state um, uh, policies, uh, thinking maybe about France, uh, or again, or the Nordic countries, where we might uh, think that uh, socioeconomic differences in family behavior, A, are less pronounced, and B, importantly, relationships between, say, non-marital childbearing or divorce and children's resources are less pronounced than they are in the United States or Japan, for that matter, where we know that divorce, the relationship between divorce and economic resources in Japan is one of the strongest uh, in the OECD countries. Um, so I would argue that uh, there's a lot of variation um, and people have linked uh, relatively less pronounced emergence of the diverging destinies patterns to stronger welfare states, for example. And then the last one, um, fathers. Um, great, great question. Um, wonderful question. So I want to say two things on, on this. Um, one <laughs> is that demographers are always criticized um, for focusing too much on women and not enough on men. Um, but fertility is one of our main focuses. And um, for obvious reasons, we focus on women rather than men, um, although obviously both are important. Um, a, a key thing here is data. Um, with non-marital childbearing, for example, or with divorce, for example, certainly in a context like Japan where there's no joint custody um, and women tend, mothers tend to have sole custody of the children, knowing who the fathers are in a, a national sample, um, that's hard. Um, uh, you know, if we had register data like we have in Sweden or Norway or something like that, that would be great. But typically we don't have access to that. So for a lot of the questions that we're interested in, in the diverging destinies research, uh, it's just hard to know. Um, but that's not always true. And that's my second point. One of the things I, I listed that big long list of family behaviors that people doing research on diverging destinies are interested in. And, and one of them um, is a, what, what demographers call assortative mating. So another jargon term, but it basically just means who marries whom. And maybe on that um, list of terms I shared at the beginning, I could have put power couples or something like that. And I think there's a lot of public interest in who marries whom, and particularly the possibility that the most highly educated people with the most resources, men and women, are marrying each other. And those at the bottom are increasingly marrying each other um, with implications for children's resources. So this is a situation in which fathers and mothers together, their education or income or occupation, um, and it's linked to children's resources, would be central to the research focus um, so, so that's, that's one um, example. And I think you asked about um, unexpected findings. Well, one unexpected finding just to throw out um, there for hopefully your interest is that contrary to the United States and some other countries where we do see a growing concentration of highly educated professional women and men marrying each other um, and at the corresponding pattern at the low end of the distribution, in Japan, actually, we see a decline in highly educated women and highly educated men marrying each other. Um, so this is sort of contrary. That's not to say that there aren't more power couples because that also has says something about income and occupation, but it is to say that the prevalence of homogamy 
um, is, is, has been declining in the Japanese context. So that's kind of surprising. Thank you. The next question, and uh, uh, please briefly, uh, please. Uh, Sorry, it's a very brief. I'm not brief. I'm not brief. brief. <laughs> Sorry, those were such uh, good questions. One, one, I wanted to give a long answer. One of the, one of the slides <laughs> mentioned the lack of assortative marriage in Japan. Yes. Can you talk about that more? Ah. I, I hear talks about increasing tendency for assortative marriage in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Though I have not seen any systematic studies. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I'll, I'll answer that very briefly because that's what I was just talking about. So assortative mating, again, who marries whom, and particularly the concern in the context of diverging destinies about concentration of resources at the top and at the bottom, uh, concentration of limited resources at the bottom. And as I was saying, demographers have a very specific way of modeling um, and understanding patterns of assortative mating. And um, as more women get higher levels of education, yes, the number of high educate, college educated women, college educated men marrying, that's increasing. But the likelihood net of that compositional change, so the measures of preferences or propensities to form highly educated pairings has gone down over time. And if you're interested in um, systematic evaluation, a student and I just published a, a short, mimi, a short um, uh, monograph called, I think, Educational Assortative Mating in Japan. I don't know. We're not so creative with titles, but it's published by Springer. It's about 100 pages. And I think pretty much everything you could want to know about educational assortative mating in Japan is covered in there. Maybe the last question, which is in Japanese, uh, I will read it slowly. Sure. And, um, please answer it uh, uh, in English. It's okay. 最近日本政府も子供家庭庁を作り、来年から多様な家族の形や子供に対する支援を始め落としていますが、これに関してどのように考えていらっしゃいますか。今まで少子化問題は国や行政によって認識されてきたとは思うのですが。比較的小さな政府で、かつ授業、コンフューシアニズム、家制度という規範が潜在的に残る社会では、そもそもこの人口減少を改善するのには、もう手遅れ、もしくは適していない構造なのではないかと思いますが、この点についてどうお考えでし
the implications of low fertility and population decline. And you asked if that's um, uh, too late, uh, right? And, and I think the answer is, is yes. Um, unequivocally, the answer is yes, that it's too late in the absence of mass immigration, um, the population will continue to shrink for a long time. Um, and I think a better question is, you know, how does the society respond um, to a shrinking and aging population? Because I don't think, you know, demographers study this, we've studied this for decades. You can't just immediately increase fertility tomorrow via a policy intervention, which won't happen anyways, but even if you magically could, the momentum built into the population from decades of low fertility, below replacement fertility, that will continue to play out over time um, in the form of population aging and population decline. Even if magically we um, implemented a policy by which all Japanese women gave birth to three children, still is not gonna help. I mean, it's gonna help, but it's not going to um, stem population decline uh, because of the structure of the population uh, and the low, um, the small size of the childbearing population for years to come. Um, so I, I think your skepticism on that front is, is right. Um, yeah, um, I'll stop there, but okay. I, I think it's a great question. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. The time is now up, so I, I need to stop uh, the interaction with the audience now. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, because I want to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We have um, uh, many questions, comment, uh, comments, but um, I, I will hand Please. all yeah. these uh, prints to Professor Lemo later. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk and uh, very yeah. interesting intervention from Professor Konishi. Thank you very much for both. And uh, uh, now uh, today's event is over. And thank you very much uh, for attending today's event and see you uh, soon in the next uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.